I'm Debbie, and I have essential thrombus anthemia. You might be wondering what that is. Essential thrombus anthemia is a form of chronic leukemia or blood and bone marrow malignancy or blood cancer. It's a slow-moving blood cancer. It's one of four diseases um, in a group of diseases called uh, myoproliferative neoplasms or MPNs for short. I found out quite by accident in September 2011 um, by just having a regular yearly CBC. Uh, my, after I had that CBC done, my doctor called me and my blood platelets were over a million and a quarter. And you might be wondering what should they be? And they should be between 150 and 450,000 per milliliter of blood. So you can see mine were way high. Uh, we did a second CBC that came back with the same results. And so my GP sent me to Atlanta Cancer Care and I went to um, my first appointment with them. They did another CBC on the same results, over a million and a quarter. So my oncologist um, scheduled um, as an outpatient at St. Joseph's Hospital for me to have a blood, uh, uh, um, blood test done and then to go in and have CT scans done and ultrasounds done and to finish up by having a... Um, bone marrow biopsy and aspiration done, where they would actually go into my hip bone and harvest some of that red spongy um, bone marrow that we all have inside our bones. So that was done, and a week later the results came back uh, that the pathologist read it, and the report was sent to my um, oncologist that I had uh, primary thrombocythemia, which simply means that my body is mass-producing blood platelets. Now, the body has a signaling way. We have these magnificent bodies in the body. When the body needs more platelets, and platelets are used to plug the hole or stop uh, hemorrhaging or bleeding. Uh, so when the body needs more platelets, it will signal the bone marrow, send me some more platelets, produce us some more platelets. Well, in people like myself that have essential thrombocythemia, that signaling um, uh, device in the bone marrow is broken. Uh, to give you a little bit of an idea on how that is, consider yourself go walk into a room, flip on a light switch. When you flip on the light switch, the lights come on. When you go back and flip it off, the lights go off. Well, sort of the same way it works in this signaling pathway with essential thrombocythemia. The body has signaled we need more platelets, but now that switch is broken and it won't turn off, so the body, my body is just mass-producing platelets. Now, platelets are sticky, and they can stick together and form little clots or embolisms and go into the bloodstream, and uh, you can have a stroke, a heart attack, or you can have a, a blood clot in your legs. So there's some serious life-threatening um, side effects or symptoms of essential thrombocythemia. Now, there, it's a, uh, considered a orphan disease. It's rare. It's incurable. So that means that if a patient comes in and is found that they have uh, true primary thrombocythemia, they and they are having symptoms of this illness, then they're going to be on aspirin daily and a drug either um, hydroxyurea or hydrea, uh, agrolin or um, pegylated interferon alpha-2, or the, uh, it might be the JAK2 inhibitors. Uh, I personally was on 500 milligrams of hydrea, uh, and I was on that for a while. My blood platelet still didn't come down, and then my oncologist uh, increased it to 15, uh, up to 1,000 milligrams one day, 1,500 milligrams the next day, alternating. Uh, and I stayed on that for about 18 months, and during that period of time, I had such fatigue, I could barely go. I didn't want to get out of bed. I wanted to just crawl in bed, pull the covers over my head. It was not like me. I'm a very active and outgoing person, so I didn't understand this. It was just really frustrating, and I, then I started having severe, and I'm talking severe, shortness of breath, where I would be exhausted to walk down a flight of stairs in my house. So that um, went on for a while, and I talked to my oncologist, and she said well, she just didn't understand uh, what was going on with me, and um, she didn't um, 
switch me to taking a different, you know, doing a different medication. Now, hydroxyurea is the drug of choice for most hematology oncologists in the treatment of essential thrombocythemia. But I stayed on that as long as I could, and I just stopped taking it. Now, I am not advocating anybody do this. It's dangerous. Do not take yourself off a of medication without talking to your doctor first. But I was absolutely convinced it was the hydrea, and uh, my oncologist um, basically did not agree with me, and I know my body. We all know our bodies better than um, uh, anybody else, so I stopped taking it. Uh, and then I uh, decided that I would go online and research um, the leading hematology oncologist in the United States, and I was going to... Um, go wherever that was for a second opinion because I was I'll be honest with you I was I felt so bad I didn't know believe that I was going to make it I made out my will I made a DNR I put on my bedroom door and I signed everything over to my children um I just was that sick so I found, uh, after all my research, um, that led me to Mayo Clinic, uh, Scottsdale, Arizona, and to Dr. Ruben Mesa, who is one of the world's leading hematology oncologists. I called his office. They asked me to forward my uh, previous CT scans, ultrasounds, x-rays, um, uh, EKG, stress test, colonoscopy, and the results of my bone marrow biopsy and aspiration done. Uh, now, in 2012, I had all of those tests done within a few months, and I was absolutely going to my oncologist every two weeks, and I was absolutely exhausted. Uh, so anyway, I flew out to Mayo Clinic. I met with uh, Dr. Mesa. Uh, he had uh, scheduled while I was at Mayo Clinic, both at uh, Scottsdale, Arizona, at Mayo Clinic, uh, between there and the Mayo Hospital in Phoenix, Arizona, that I would have all of those tests repeated in three days' time. And that was a lot, but I was determined to find out what was going on. And, you know, you have to be proactive and take care of your own health, be your own health care advocate. And I was that sick, and I was determined to find out what the problem was and if there was anything I could do and get on the medication that I felt was going to be the best for me. So um, my first meeting with Dr. Messa on the morning that I arrived um, he told me that he had reviewed um, the test x-rays from my prior test and uh, bone marrow biopsy and aspiration. And according to what the results of that test, I definitely had primary thrombocythemia with mild myelofibrosis. Well, that was a shock to me because I was not told that I had some myelofibrosis in my bone marrow. And you don't want to have myelo progression to myelo. Fibrosis. Now, people that have VT can, although the percentage is low, they can uh, progress into acute myeloid leukemia, or they can progress into myelofibrosis. And if you have primary myelofibrosis, that means that that spongy, liquidy type bone marrow in your um, bones becomes fibrous and it's no longer able to make blood cells. And so the only treatment for that is a bone marrow transplant. So um, I definitely did not uh, uh, want that. And I was uh, taken back when I found out that I did have about 8, to 10, 8 or 10% myelofibrosis. Um, Dr. Messa repeated uh, the bone marrow biopsy and aspiration the next day, and I spent three days there at Mayo Clinic, shuttled back between both hospitals, got all those tests done, and on the final day that I met with Dr. Messa before I uh, flew back to Atlanta, he told me that I definitely did not need to be on hydrea and that he thought that according to my test results, uh, where I was in the spectrum of myelofibrosis and the um, uh, side effects and symptoms I was having, that he wanted to uh, me to fly back home and to go see Dr. Elliot Winton, and he would collaborate on my case, and, and um, I could see him once a year. 
and uh, uh, Dr. Elliot Winton is the Director of Hematology Oncology at uh, Winship Cancer Institute at Emory University Hospital in Atlanta. And Dr. Mesa told me that he would forward, he would actually call him, and um, I would call and set up an appointment, and he would be familiar with my case when I got back home. So I did that, and of course I had to have a third bone marrow biopsy and aspiration done, all those tests done again at Emory, at Winship Cancer Institute. But that was okay. I was now on the path to finding out what was going on and what could I take to bring my blood platelets back down, take me back out of the critical stage that I was in. I certainly did not want to have a stroke or a heart attack or bleed to death um, if I got in a car accident or something or had to have emergency surgery. So I had to do something in order to get myself where I was on a medication I needed to be on since I was presenting with symptoms. So... Um, I got started in with Dr. Winton, and two months later, I was approved to uh, be one of 160 uh, patients in the clinical trial on pegylated interferon alpha-2A, and that was uh, between Winship Cancer Institute in collaboration with Mount Sinai um, in New York City. So I started on November the 21st of 2013. I started my first injectable um, dosage of interferon, and I uh, only have to uh, do that, um, do an injection every Friday, which is really great because some people are on it two or three times a week. I'm on it once a week, and my blood platelets have dropped from around a million to 333,000 last Thursday. Now, when the balancing act with when you get a drug like this and your blood platelets lower into the normal range, um, you also have the problem of your white blood cells and your red blood cells becoming lower too. So Dr. Winton told me before I started this drug that he would have to bring me down to an anemic stage, and I am anemic. My white and my red blood cells are low. But um, they will adjust my interferon that's dropping like a rock, my platelets. So they will uh, back off my treatment, my dosage if they have to, in order to stop my white blood and my red blood cells from dropping further because we don't want to do this. So you can see that this is going to be, for patients that have this disease, it's going to be a lifetime balancing act of not only keeping these blood platelets uh, in check, but also keeping your um, anemia in check and keeping white blood cells and red blood cells within a safe range. Now, interferon is working great for me. My shortness of breath has disappeared and my fatigue is 90% better. But there is always um, a danger that interferon could cause damage to your liver, your spleen, or your thyroid, or your eyes. So those are checked every time I go. And since November 2013 until this week, I have been going every two weeks to see my oncologist. And because my blood platelets have dropped down in the 300 range, um, I'm probably, uh, he said, might be able to go once a month for at least three months and see how that goes. Now, I had to sign a lot of papers, uh, a lot of uh, documents, um, both at uh, uh, Mount Sinai Hospital in New York and at Winship Cancer Institute to be part of this clinical trial, but I'm grateful to be a part of it, and it is a two- to a four-year uh, length program. So, um, like I said, I'm doing well, um, and all of the symptoms have dissipated, and there are so many people that have essential thrombocythemia that have migraines, they have itching and burning feet and hands, headaches, dizzy spells, um, they have uh, symptoms and side effects of the disease, then you have symptoms and side effects of these harsh chemo drugs. So... Uh, while there is hope, there is still living a lifetime of dealing with ups and downs 
uh, of these illnesses. And um, one of the other things that I wanted to mention that Dr. Uh, Winton told me when I started on interferon, uh, now there is a slight possibility, not slight, but a mild possibility just on the 